Welcome everybody, uh, welcome uh, the active participants, welcome all those who view us, who listen to us, and uh, I'm very happy that on behalf of the CIES and the IPP in Vienna, the one in Istanbul, the one in Vienna, uh, could organize that. Uh, so that's a real big event. It's the second event in, in a series of events, and uh, I'm very, very happy that you are all here. Uh, you're all here, uh, I think uh, nearly here, because uh, the first I want to mention is Hannah Celeste, Editor-in-Chief at uh, Ukraine Analytica. So just, yeah, here she is again, live. She just got a jab into her arm and uh, is still in the car going to the place where she would uh, join us uh, directly, but uh, we're very happy that you are here. Then uh, we have Dimitri Trenin, uh, Director of Carnegie Moscow Center, the personality of the Moscow Center. Then we have Ekaterina or Eka Tekashvili. He, she is head of the program of the European Anti-Corruption Initiative in Ukraine and a former vice prime minister of Georgia. So the Georgians are quite uh, active, are or were, some were active, some are active in uh, Ukraine. And Victoria Rosa, former security and defense advisor to the prime minister Ma Maya Sandu from Moldova. So we have a, a very, very interesting panel. We have uh, more than the gender balance. Uh, that's good because it has to balance some other events perhaps where we don't have that kind of gender balance. And I thank you very much, uh, first of all, that you are here, that uh, you joined us. So uh, we speak about uh, the Black Sea. I have here a globe and if you see, uh, you know it, but. It's a very small area, but it's a very critical area, the area where many interests clash and, and are here. Uh, so I think um, it is good that we have uh, uh, a discussion about it because it is an area which could be an area of peace and cooperation, but on the other hand, it's an area where at least for the moment, we have um, more conflicts than cooperation, more conflicts uh, than peace. Um, one of the big powers, of course, who, who is interested, who is engaged in this area, who has special interest in the area, not only now, but again, very special interest now, is, of course, Russia. And therefore, I would ask Dimitri Trenin to describe a bit, from his point of view, what interests of Russia are predominant? What, what is Russia up to in that area? Very often, in, at least in the West, in the European Union and other places, it is seen as, uh, well, Russia is aggressive. Others say, no, it's just defensive because Russia saw that the West is expansion, expanding and there's an expansion of the European Union, of the NATO maybe, uh, and Russia has to react. So uh, maybe you, from all your experience, and you have a lot of experience and knowledge, can a bit explain how you see Russia's activities, behavior, attitude to this area as it is today, knowing, of course, that uh, it's a long uh, story if you think about all what have been, has been done in, 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 in this area and how Russia was developing, uh, including, of course, the Crimea special case, which we will touch, of course, anyway later. But please, uh, Dimitri. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, Hannes. Uh, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be your guest. It's a pleasure to be on the panel. Um, I think I would say, for starters, that uh, uh, there are two things, two important uh, conditions that uh, we're dealing with in, in that part of the world. One is the continuing impact of the um, downfall and um, disintegration of the Soviet slash Russian empire. These things uh, uh, may happen very quickly, as uh, was the case of the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union, but they, but they leave a very long trail and uh, sometimes it takes decades for the uh, dust to settle down. And I think this is what we are witnessing in, 
in, in that part of the, of the world. It is no easy thing for uh, the former imperial power to um, accommodate to the uh, new conditions. And uh, clearly the initial response uh, may not be the final one. And uh, we have seen the Russian, the evolution of Russia's foreign policy toward uh, the former Soviet space, toward individual countries, toward the region of the Black Sea. And we can talk about that. So this is the uh, one reality. The other reality is the emergence of new states, states that uh, uh, it's, uh, it, the peoples in the region have a long and uh, proud history and rich history, but uh, uh, none of the countries of the former Soviet Union in that part of the world has had a history of uh, modern statehood. And it takes, uh, it takes quite an effort to build a state, to form a nation. And these processes, just like the process of the accommodation of the former empire to its post-imperial condition, the uh, rise of new country, new states, the emergence of new nations is, uh, is often a very challenging process, usually a very challenging process. So this is uh, one reality. The other reality um, is, the, is the context in which these conflicts have been placed uh, recently. And that reality is the the confrontation between uh, Russia and the United States, and I would say to a degree Russia and NATO, Russia and, uh, uh, and the West. So the Black Sea region is not just uh, another former Soviet area uh, where you have the conflicts I have described or where you have the competing interests that I have described, but it's also part of the uh, more general um, uh, picture of uh, uh, of this uh, major power confrontation, or however you want to define it, confrontation between Russia and and America, and that makes uh, these conflicts uh, even more difficult to uh, to deal with, to manage, uh, not to speak of resolving them. So I think that. Uh, Russia's interest in the region is uh, essentially, it's essentially twofold. One, I think, is uh, um, bolstering its own security in the region. And I think that uh, you, would, you would agree that for a long time, that was the most restive of all regions on Russia's Perimeter. I'm talking about the North Caucasus. I'm talking about Chechnya. So we had a decade of uh, of war in the in the North Caucasus. Um, you also have um, more recent. Well, of course, you have uh, the uh, the the smaller conflicts uh, in uh, in uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, uh, Transnistria. Uh, that uh, were the products of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And uh, they required uh, a bit of attention. So you had to secure, uh, you as Russia had to secure uh, 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 those conflicts so that they don't blow up and they don't, don't blow into your face. Um, and of course, uh, more recently, there has been uh, a running conflict, uh, a very serious one, one that I think will last um, for a very long time, and that is the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. I'm not talking about Crimea or Donbass uh, separately, uh, or, or do, not talk, do not focus on those conflicts. I'm talking about the, the wider, the underlying conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And I think what we have seen um, from the Russian side is the emergence of um, uh, a hostile nation in Ukraine, a hostile, certainly a hostile um, state in Ukraine. 
And this is not something that uh, will pass uh, quickly or will pass without an effort. This is, this is a very unwelcome reality with which uh, Russia will have to deal uh, for a fairly long time. So you have uh, the, I think the most important thing is the, is the security aspect, the security, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the package of security related interests. Uh, the other um, package, I think smaller one, is um, um, Russia's attempt to make sure that uh, uh, it retains influence in the region. It, I think it's the other side of the coin. So you, you defend, if you like, against the perceived or real threats, and then you seek to uh, deal with uh, the sources of those threats by uh, trying to expand your influence, trying to influence uh, the countries in the region so that they do not uh, take an overly hostile view or that they join you or whatever. And uh, there, I think Russia has uh, fairly little to show in terms of successes. Um, it doesn't, except for Armenia, which is uh, an ally, but it's a difficult relationship as we all understand now. Russia doesn't have formal allies in the region. Uh, it has been trying to uh, compete for influence in uh, Moldova. Uh, and I think the competition is still continuing. Uh, Russia has had to um, realize that uh, Georgia is uh, essentially a U.S. ally, an informal ally of the, of the United States and an aspirant candidate to join NATO, which clearly is, um, uh, is an issue for Russia. Azerbaijan, I don't know whether you want to include Azerbaijan in, in, in your region, is very much uh, um, a loner, a country that manages pretty well, actually, various uh, uh, balances and is closest to Turkey, which uh, in many ways is a rival to Russia, a familiar rival, I should say, for regional influence. And the relationship with Turkey, although I understand this is not part of our discussion today, is a, a very complex relationship for Russia, which is um, which has elements of cooperation moderated by elements of competition. And it's uh, also it's a relationship very much linked to the personality of President Erdogan. And of course, we don't know what happens when President Erdogan is uh, no longer at the helm of the Turkish state. So it's, 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 it's a very messy, uh, very difficult, very dangerous, in many ways, uh, uh, part of uh, Russia's um, uh, neighborhood. Uh, but that is where Russia is very much involved uh, on all those fronts I have described. Thank you very much for this very, I think, detailed and very, I think, explanatory um, design or let's say description of what Russia is, is up to. Um, of course, on, on Turkey, we will come later because we cannot uh, discuss the issue without Turkey, even if a Turkish participant is not with us uh, today. Uh, may I just have one question to Ukraine because I will then ask Hannah Jeles to, to come in. Um, when you say about uh, this uh, underlying conflict with Ukraine, uh, as a hostile nation, when did Ukraine start to be a hostile nation? With independence, uh, with the toppling of uh, Yanukovych before, or was it a step-by-step -step process? How did it really become um, a hostile nation according to the Russian point of view? Well, I think many Russians would say it's a brotherly nation. It's uh, We don't just like the government uh, and uh, the people. They are like us, uh, No, no difference. Uh, I do not share that view. And I, again, I'm not, do not pretend to know much about Ukraine or to posit as, a, as an expert in Ukraine. But to me, Ukraine has always been a, a, a complex territory and a complex country. And um, uh, I think that uh, a large portion of uh, Ukrainians prior to uh, the conflict that started in 2014, 
were fairly well predisposed toward Russia. I wouldn't say, as as President Putin says, that uh, Russians and Ukrainians are one people. I think this is an oversimplification, and this um, does not um, does not realize the 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 gulf, the very wide and deep gulf that separates the Ukrainian elite from from Russia, from the Russian uh, elite. And the incompatibility of the Ukrainian um, statehood project with any form of uh, integration with Russia. And this is something that I think the Kremlin failed to understand uh, before the crisis and during the crisis. But the war, I think, um, the war that started in, in, in Donbass uh, was very much... Um, uh, um, a process that uh, helped create a modern political nation in Ukraine. Normally, political nations are created during wars. Uh, you have to, it, it's difficult to simply expect uh, an, a number of people in a certain territory uh, to consider themselves a nation until and unless there is a vital issue that they all have to face. And uh, this vital issue was the. Uh, the war in Donbass. And I think it was during the war that uh, uh, a large part of the Ukrainian population uh, considered themselves to be uh, a nation, not only separate from Russia, but uh, inimical to Russia and rejecting anything and everything that was Russian. And uh, I think this, uh, th this was this was the dynamic that led to this. Uh, maybe hostile nation is too much, too too much of an exaggeration. If you look at the public opinion polls, uh, uh, the situation is not as stark as I have described. But the uh, the active part of uh, the the bulk of the active part of the Ukrainian population is certainly uh, pretty hostile to Russia today. And uh, I don't have any illusion that this hostility will last a very long time, a very long time, which means uh, I won't see the end of it personally. We should have a long time and long, should live long, uh, as long as it's possible to, to see <laughs> reconciliation. But uh, Hannah, you're a bit younger, uh, so maybe you see it. Uh, what do you uh, how, how do you perceive the arguments and the analysis of uh, Dimitri? Uh, you know, I definitely don't want this next hour to be Russian-Ukrainian dialogue, as we are talking about the Black Sea and Russia managed to have much more crises than only um, Ukraine in the Black Sea for the last years. But uh, there are definitely several points yeah. that uh, I, I feel uh, are, it, it is the must to reply. First of all, about the hostile nation, honestly, uh, it was quite an interesting uh, because we always thought about Ukraine as a defending nation. So hostile means you are aggressive and uh, it's quite uh, difficult uh, to be passionate and calm when somebody is annexing part of your territory and destroying completely another part of your territory. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, uh, to name Ukraine as a hostile nation sounds uh, not just manipulative, but even provocative. Uh, even if you speak from 2014, Ukraine didn't do anything uh, at that time when uh, one of its regions being just uh, illegally annexed and uh, manipulated and her, uh, her navy being just destroyed and currently having two million people being IDPs. Concerning the uh, um, rejecting Russia and everything, let's be honest, that is more of the uh, uh, reactive rather than proactive. Uh, Ukraine been under the quite a serious Russian pressure for centuries with the prohibition of Ukrainian culture and language in the 19th century, officially, with killing Ukrainian intelligentsia and uh, um, poets uh, and uh, all people who really been the heart of the Ukrainian nation in 1930s with Holodomor, with all other processes. So it's been collecting for years. And then we came in... Uh, independent Ukraine times from 1990s, when Moscow preferred to neglect the sovereignty of uh, 
uh, other republics, and it's not policy only about Ukraine, the same uh, my colleagues from Georgia and Moldova can say in different years about uh, their countries as well, and definitely 2014. Uh, even at that year, if you check the uh, uh, sociological uh, uh, surveys of 14, 15, uh, you can't find a really anti-Russian sentiments in Ukraine. Uh, it was very important to understand that there were anti-Kremlin sentiments, definitely because of the uh, um, uh, let's say because of the uh, uh, Putin policy, Kremlin policy, Crimea, Donbas, and all these uh, actions, but it was okay with the Russian people. Ukrainians became more anti-Russian in probably the last two, three years. That is connected with the uh, behavior of Russian population because uh, it is connected with that propaganda coming from Russian media. It is connected with the fact how many percentage of Russian population support uh, aggressive actions of Kremlin in Donbass and in uh, Crimea. You can see the numbers and they really shocked a lot of Ukrainians. Um, why named propaganda? Because you hear in the media that Ukraine is not a nation, that it is artificial, that it is the... Uh, um, completely uh, failed state that uh, uh, Ukrainian state should not exist uh, and so as the Ukrainians are fascist. I can continue this crazy list of uh, uh, statements that Russian politicians and Russian media are saying about Ukraine. So currently, if to simplify this situation, we're like, you know, um, teenagers that suddenly were good friends, uh, but one of them decided to date uh, another person, in Ukrainian case, uh, European Union and NATO, uh, because it's grown up. But uh, a Ukrainian old friend, Russia, started to be aggressive and bullying them and just pretend that you should be mine for years. So, you know, I understand that it is crazy simplification, but that is what is happening, that uh, Russia created the complexes, psychological complexes of uh, ex-empire, of the ex-Soviet uh, by itself, and as a result, its neighbors are now the uh, uh, sometimes victims, sometimes survivors, because we don't uh, want to think about self as victims, as uh, we're still an independent state, we're still fighting for our sovereignty. So it means that we, we are surviving the uh, uh, Russian policies. But let's be honest, like if you allow me to turn it more to the Black Sea, um, not, not to make just a ping pong with the uh, uh, Dmitry about the perceptions of two countries. Um, unfortunately, we should definitely understand that this Russian behavior uh, had very serious implications uh, for the neighborhood and first of all for the Black Sea region. Uh, because definitely uh, a lot of, of those processes about uh, breaking the sovereignty of other states, violating the international law, uh, making problems in the maritime domain with the very sophisticated measures uh, of what is happening now in the Black Sea, that became a new reality and like a testing ground. Because uh, what we noticed from 2014 till uh, 2021 in the Black Sea region. Uh, for the last year, we started to see in the Northern Sea, in Baltics, and even in uh, the uh, um, in Asia. Uh, Japan, for example, I know that Ministry of Defense of Japan is very carefully uh, analyzing what is happening in the Black Sea region. What are the Russian tactics in maritime domain here? Uh, how they behave in Crimea and uh, uh, making conclusions from this, how they should behave uh, around the, uh, uh, their disputed island. So uh, for these, it seems to me that that competition, that struggling that is happening now um, in the Black Sea region is extremely important because it's not only about Russia and Georgia, uh, Russia and Ukraine, Russia and Moldova. But it is more about the uh, testing ground of the new, let's name it hybrid or any other um, variant of actions that is trying to undermine any kind of stability and development um, in the region. So if I have listened to you carefully, and I have, uh, you would confirm what Dimitri said indirectly, at least, that is a long-lasting conflict and you don't see any any chance soon to overcome it, because all of what you said is, is uh, understandable, I don't want to criticize this, it's a strong uh, condemnation of Russian behavior, and um, so you don't see any 
green light or any light in, at the end of the tunnel. So the tunnel of conflict will be very, very long and dark. Let's say that uh, it's always a possibility for uh, the, like, as, as the person who is dealing with conflict around the world for years, I know that even the most difficult conflicts one day can be resolved. The question is if we address the real cause of the conflict and do you really understand the roots of the conflict and what should be the basic changes? Because that's e easy uh, to sign an agreement, for example. Yes, we can sign a peace agreement any day. That is the easiest. The process of that created, artificially constructed uh, perception of each other is much more difficult. The behavior of politicians is much more difficult. The change of the demography in Crimea, for example, is much more difficult. And that's what the United Nations just confirmed in their resolutions. And uh, what is more, it is the understanding that uh, with the current leadership of Kremlin, unfortunately, it's probably almost impossible. Because with each new statement, it is the feeling that they made this conflict at the basis of the survival of their uh, power, meaning that they are not able to propose something new for the development. So the search of the external enemies of the big international wins are seen as the only way of securing power. So with this precondition, or better say, without changing of this precondition, it's quite a difficult to speak about other aspects of conflict resolution. Okay, thank you. So you spoke about what is uh, not possible, and maybe afterwards we can speak what is possible. But first, I want to come to ask Eka about her position with her experience in Georgia and Ukraine and in the whole region. Eka, sure. please. Sure, thank you. I'll try to, to be concise, but give a bit of a regional perspective, perhaps, with the way it is seen from, from Georgian perspective. Hereby, I represent, obviously, more my country in terms of the perspective. But uh, we can have a comparison of that, obviously, with any other countries as well with, with the region. First, I think it would be good for our audience as well to have an overall perspective of what is it as a current picture in a different layers of different realities that different uh, parties uh, to different conflicts might see. But ultimately, there's always something as a matter of truth, right, as a factual description of where we are. And then if we look into that, there are different elements that... Uh, I would believe are not controversial at this time, even if you look at it from different perspectives. One is that the Black Sea region is extremely militarized region now. And then uh, the trend of militarization has been rising. And then uh, it, the, the game changer at the time was not the occupation of the Abkhazian region. However, in 2008, after the occupation, we've seen already militarization of that part of Georgia being under the Russian occupation with missile, not only defense, but offensive systems being placed like Iskanders, for example, in Abkhazian region. Uh, but... But but the scale of that obviously became uncomparable to that after the uh, attempted annexation, as I like to call it, uh, when we speak about annexation of Crimea. So what we have now is uh, is a situation which resembles um, at some point an old times, uh, but a bit reversed in a way when in the in late 18s, uh, 1800s, so to say, when Turkey had a dominant. Um, power presence on the Black Sea region. And then Russia came in. We've seen the historical wars at the time between, uh, not seen, but then we know about them, between Turkey and Russia. And then the equilibrium at some point that has emerged over the time in the region. Uh, but as of now, we have a situation which is quite striking. The level of militarization is very high. It reached the point when A2, AD, the uh, offensives and defensive combination of systems are quite clear uh, when it comes to the advantage in the way that Russia possesses in the region. And Turkey is not anymore a dominant power in the Black Sea region. When we speak about military presence in the region, Russia has become a dominant power when it comes to the naval presence and then land and air force presence in the region as well. Now, I would hope that it's not the end of the story what the region has to see, but now it's quite clear that Turkey is not in the capacity to balance on its own when it comes to the Russian presence in the region. And in that sense, one would hope that Turkey could reconsider how much more NATO presence could become more desirable, perhaps, for Turkey over the time in the region. I don't see that changing now in the short term, but over the time, it should be in the strategic interest of Turkey to see that 
the status quo as it was previously acceptable uh, for Turkey, which has been broken now with the way how Russian dominant presence has established itself in the region, is an imaginary status quo. So the control over the Turkish Straits, it's any more the only remaining component of the status quo as it was. But other than that, strategically, the region has changed when it comes to the to dynamics and, and to the, in terms of security and military presence on the ground. So how that will change uh, the perspective of Turkey over the time in the region, we have to see. But uh, as of now, and that's another element that needs to be, I guess, highlighted, is that Turkey is still retreated from the region uh, predominantly. Turkey is more concentrated on its southern borders and Mediterranean rather than having uh, at its heart, so to say, more the Black Sea region, even though one would assume that this would have been a strategic domain for Turkish presence to be uh, on the ground, being Turkey and being member of NATO as well. And we all know how historically Turkey became member of NATO and then what were the frictions at the time with at the time Soviet Union and what caused that <clears throat> entry into the NATO at the time for Turkey and openness of the U.S. and then of the alliance eventually, obviously, as well for Turkey to become member. So now we have that situation that quantitatively, if one compares, one can have this argument as if, you know, Russia is encircled by NATO members and then, you know, aspirant countries. So what Russia can do? But in essence, what has happened is that Russia seize the opportunity, a bit of a vacuum of retreating, strategically retreating Turkey from the region. U.S. has never entered the region uh, in the way that would have actually competed in a meaningful sense in the way U.S. can compete in the region with anybody. And that was the case for the competition with Russia in the region itself, with all might, so to say, that otherwise U.S. could have had considering objective restrictions with, with the Montreux Convention and then everything else. Uh, and then EU always had a very weak presence in the Black Sea region. So as soon as Russia got stronger and it went back to its own roots of the imperial strategic vision, because what we see now is Russia back as an imperial power. It's not post-imperial. We need to understand that it's an imperial Russian power in 21st century as a resurgent power. And it acts in the strategic concept as imperial Russia always had. Black Sea was in itself strategically important, and then Black Sea was important always as a lunch pad, spring broad, so to say, for power projection outside of the Black Sea region. And that we have seen already how it has materialized itself in the way how Russia used uh, through the Black Sea access to the Mediterranean and then for launching attacks and then military support that it gave to the uh, Assad regime in Syria. So the very notion of Black Sea being that exit point uh, strategically for Russia outside of the Black Sea region as well, has demonstrated itself in practice. It's not just a strategic premise in that regard. So Russia has managed in that sense effectively to establish itself as a dominant power that already uses its, uh, uh, its, its the qualitative increase of its presence in the region as a springboard for its uh, power projection outside of the Black, region, Black Sea region and uses it effectively basically to take outside of the theater of operation of the Black Sea, Western countries, uh, by being able to, to project power outside of the Black Sea. So manipulation, jungling with, with, with the way how Russia acts inside of the Black Sea region and outside uh, has shown... Uh, uh, remarkable maneuverability, so to say, in the brackets, I would say it's not a sense of appreciation that I'm, I'm pointing out here. Now, one thing that needs to be uh, clearly mentioned in this case is that how Russia managed to get to that point. And, and this is another important factor to be mentioned. Russia managed to gain that level of strategic dominance only by destroying the rules-based order in the Black Sea region and by that creating a precedent on complete disregard of the basic fundamental principles of public international law, including prohibition of use of force against any other nation and including neighbors, obviously, by having an, an, an unpunished action, basically, in that sense, in the Black Sea region, starting from 2008 in Georgia and continued in 2014 in Ukraine. If not military action against neighbors, if not continued occupation of those regions that Russia now possesses only through the illegal use of force, and by that having a military presence of the kind that it has in an increasing way in the region, 
there wouldn't have been the dominance in the region that Russia obtained. And it's, it's a result uh, of, of uh, illegal actions of the kind that go against fundamental uh, use Kogan's norms of public international law. And that needs to be highlighted. It's not just savviness, smartness, power, strategic, uh, you know, uh, possess that Russia had to do this, but this was ability and readiness to achieve strategic goals by flagrant violations of international law. And that's what we're experiencing here. So basically one of the features now of the Black Sea region is that there is no predictability of international law anymore. And it's not only with the four norms that I've just mentioned, but I just wanted to remind our audience of incidents of 2019, for example, when Russia used its military presence in the region uh, under the threshold of Article 5, but still when it basically stopped maritime connectivity on the territory which is roughly one-fourth of the whole Black Sea region uh, for, for civil, commercial maritime um, uh, maritime connections as well for Bulgaria, Romania, Georgia at the time, Ukraine as well, as a response to what? As a legal and lawful military exercises organized by NATO in the region where NATO is legally present by having three members of the alliance uh, being the literal countries of the Black Sea region. So we already see that Russia is not only having that presence used uh, in, in the extreme force as it had for occupation related reasons for maintaining that power, but is using it already in a disruptive way for economic relations in the region. So what we face now is, is a disruption of not only the legal terrain of the economic and commercial predictability uh, of actions of the, of the coastal line uh, countries, uh, projects that have greater possibilities for economic connectivity of east to the west. And by that, for example, the port in Anaglia in Georgia could be named as an example, which has been hugely, hugely protested by Russia and Russia made all uh, uh, that it could with our current government in Georgia so that this uh, project with the U.S. Uh, company's engagement uh, in building up of this port would have never materialized. So we see a militarized region. We see a disrupted uh, uh, political dynamics around the region where dominant power in the region does not even bother to create alliances anymore with the countries that it oppresses in this case, or having a pretense of making up relationships. And the, the one of the victims of all of that was that multilateralism is gone in the Black Sea region. Uh, we can have pro forma now all of the organizations and platforms that have emerged, BSEC and not only, they are dead. I mean, they are there by names, but then there's no multilateral uh, discourse of any kind right now because of what happened in the region and because how Russia now acts still in the region. So in that sense, uh, the only uh, way forward in this situation for having a chance for reversing back the disruptive dynamics in the region is to increase the deterring powers and capacities and capabilities of, of countries uh, that are suffering and are being victimized by openly military and by hybrid actions, uh, benign influences and economic uh, actions as well from the Russian side. So that Russia sees that the balance is within the reach to be achieved first in the region, and then the biggest strategic goal would be to go back to the situation when international law means something, when countries could have predictability of respect to their sovereignty, to their borders, so that uh, pacta sunt servanda principle regains its own meaning when it comes to economic projects, when it comes to anything else that could be part of multilateral and bilateral domain of um, connectivity within the region. And I don't even want to now go at depth, but this is a factor as well of what is the degree of human suffering that everything that I've mentioned brings to the region now. It's tens of thousands of uh, people that are simply killed in Ukraine have been thousands in Georgia, IDPs and killed throughout the conflicts, uprooted families. And this is still part of a reality in the region. We still see every day that people who still are residing in the areas that are occupied, they don't have access to basic human rights in Crimea, in Abkhazian region on the coastal line. So unfortunately, what could have been a region 
uh, as a gateway for economic prosperity and connectivity uh, between Caspian Sea and then in Europe and then further down perhaps China, Caspian Sea, Caucasus, uh, Turkey, uh, and then uh, European countries, including as a backdoor to all of that in a good sense of that, the Balkans, it still suffers from that unfortunate reality of militarization. Uh, lack of uh, legal uh, framework that is respected when it comes to public international law, an emerging uh, dominant power that has uh, no respect and regard uh, to rules-based international order, basically. And in 21st century, bringing back the ideology and strategies that are more pertinent and linked to uh, the 19th and the 18th. And when it comes to the development of internal dynamics of statehood developments in these countries, uh, I, I, I see the argument what Dimitri has mentioned. We all have vulnerabilities of our own internal resilience. Uh, yes, we had a short-lived modern democracy before, as we call it in Georgia, Red Russia came in at the time and occupied Georgia in 1921, First Republic, First Constitution, which, by the way, we've celebrated its uh, 100 years of anniversary of our constitution of that time. One of the most progressive, I'm proud to say at the time, in terms of human rights, universal suffrage, uh, women's rights uh, respected uh, in, in modern uh, democracy in Georgia at that time, which was killed by the Soviet Union. But uh, we have a lot to do in this direction as well, because as we have seen now everywhere in Europe as well, one of the ways for us to be resilient uh, is to have strong democracy. And here, quite a lot still needs to be done, obviously. And in that sense, it's a homework that we still uh, owe to ourselves and to our countries and societies uh, to finish or being closer to the finish line in that case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will immediately ask uh, Victoria to come in. And then, of course, Dimitri has a lot to, to explain or to answer. He's not a defendant of uh, Russian policy, but uh, uh, it's perhaps not easy to swallow all what has been said. But Victoria, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Hannes, uh, um, for giving me the possibility to interfere here, uh, mostly from the perspective of Moldova, of course, but uh, with a, a wider view on the Black Sea um, region. Of course, Moldova is not a directly riparian state in the Black Sea, but taking into account the borders that uh, we have with Romania and Ukraine and uh, the indirect, I would say, access to, to the Black Sea via Danube. I think that uh, Moldova has a very, I would say, uh, geopolitical and geostrategic positioning. Uh, and also um, this uh, refers uh, to the existing situation uh, in the uh, Eastern European uh, region, uh, taking into account also, uh, as already has been mentioned, uh, interests uh, that the um, uh, regional and not only regional actors do have uh, in uh, this uh, part of the world. And uh, here, of course, Moldova finds itself in a position uh, when uh, we do have some, uh, I would not say uh, maybe competing, uh, but uh, two existing models uh, uh, in uh, the Republic of Moldova, that it is the model that it is promoted by the European Union, which is a transformative uh, model, uh, and uh, also the Russian Federation, which, as was mentioned before, they do still have an interest in this area, taking into account um, uh, their uh, influence uh, uh, after the uh, dissolution of the of the Soviet Union. Of course, uh, in the case of Moldova, I think that one of the reminiscences of the uh, Soviet past is uh, the a conflict in the Transnistrian region, uh, which was frozen for uh, for a long time, uh, actually from 1992, after some uh, uh, very uh, small violent clashes that took place uh, um, uh, for some months. But at the same time, I think that um, uh, in the case of Moldova, um, we uh, did not have uh, violent uh, clashes since then. And um, this definitely uh, is to be considered uh, a good uh, a good thing uh, and uh, a positive example uh, of um, 
or the fact that we can continue with uh, peace and with dialogue. And uh, I think that this is one of the key issues that uh, we really need to address, because even though it is clear that there are uh, long-term conflicts uh, and also a lot of interests which are clashing uh, in the Black Sea region, we really need to start thinking also about uh, about dialogue and about cooperation and about peace. Uh, because uh, at the end of the day, each war ends up with negotiations and each war ends up with, uh, with discussion. And if we would be able to avoid uh, human losses and uh, uh, long-term conflicting i think that th this is the way that we should uh, we should uh, think a and in this uh, terms we should uh, we should construct our interests and we also should construct our strategies and here i would like to address one of the points that eka has already mentioned uh, that is uh, the fact that we have to come back to the public international law something that was disrupted uh, for uh, for a long time uh, was starting of course with the situation in Georgia, but also uh, uh, with the situation in Ukraine afterwards. And I think that it will be impossible to uh, move on with a constructive dialogue uh, if we do not come back to the principle of, uh, of international law. And here I would address some of the issues that I think that are critical, that is territorial integrity of the countries, which are uh, riparian states, of the, if we're talking about the Black Sea area. And of course, uh, it's about uh, Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine. Uh, and also we have to take into account absolutely in uh, all the strategies and all the activities and initiatives that we are promoting, the sovereign choice of the country. Because uh, we cannot ignore the fact that um, all three countries, and now I'm talking about these countries because they are represented here and um, uh, could also uh, confirm uh, what I'm saying has cho have chosen to uh, have a closer cooperation uh, with the European Union. Uh, some of them even with NATO. In the case of Moldova, of course, Moldova has a cooperation with NATO, but taking into account its neutrality status, uh, it is uh, at the level of uh, partnership uh, with uh, with NATO, and but also considered to be a very important one, uh, which definitely does have an impact on the democratic development uh, of the security sector in the Republic of Moldova. So uh, in this case, I think that this is something that should be taken into account by Russia. And here, when we are talking about Russia and how Russia it is seen in the Republic of Moldova, I think that not necessarily uh, Russia is... Uh, uh, is seen as an enemy because we cannot ignore the fact that there is a, a part of the population which is uh, still has some uh, reminiscences of the Soviet past and uh, uh, they are nostalgic of the Soviet past. But I think that the fact that, um, that uh, Russia has does not have a constructive, I would say, approach uh, to uh, to the countries. This is uh, somehow forging uh, people to have uh, um, uh, a not very friendly, I would say, uh, attitude towards uh, towards the Russian Federation. And I think that here Russia has to rethink its uh, policies and strategies towards. Uh, towards um, uh, the Black Sea region, towards the countries in the Black Sea region, because, uh, you know, people uh, in general, uh, they uh, tend to forget about geopolitics. And this is a trend that we already noticed even in Moldova, that people are not thinking in, term in geopolitical terms anymore. They are thinking in institutional terms, they are thinking about their welfare, and they will elect... Um, they will elect that model of development that will ensure for them security, safety, and welfare. And this is something that the European Union and the cooperation with the European Union is providing. So uh, in this case, I think that this is something that Russia has to think about it. And uh, uh, because ha having an offensive, uh, I would say, or uh, even an attitude that would increase uh, the uh, ignorance, but also uh, the unwillingness of the people to understand the Russian policy, 
because of uh, uh, because of its uh, manner that it is uh, promoted and something that does not really inspire trust i think that this is something that uh, uh, the russian foreign policy but also um, the russian uh, initiatives and different kind of cooperation should uh, uh, should envisage because uh, i think that uh, in, even in Moldova, we see that there is a willingness to cooperate, uh, there is a willingness for dialogue, but there is a willingness for dialogue which is based on trust uh, and also on a equal partnership. Uh, so in case this will be ensured, uh, I think that there is a big possibility to, yeah. to try to establish uh, to establish dialogue. But this dialogue should be based on, first of all, respecting the sovereign choice of the countries, uh, but also their territorial integrity, and of course, to be considered as equal partners in the discussion. Also, I would like to mention that if we're talking about formats, uh, then I think that uh, it is really important to consider the already existing formats, and the Eastern Partnership is one of the or one of the formats that uh, I would introduce here, because uh, even uh, recently there was an initiative from uh, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia in order to uh, talk uh, more about security in the framework of the Eastern Partnership, and this could also include uh, the Russian Federation, and it's important to come back to dialogue. Uh, even though it is very difficult, even though if uh, we are talking about difficult uh, partners, if we are talking about difficult situation and conflicting situation, um, it is important to uh, to start the dialogue again, to come back to uh, the international um, rules, to in the international norms, because without having a legal framework in place, which is going to be respected by all the partners, it will be impossible to overcome the conflicting uh, the existing conflicting uh, situation but once again i think that uh, uh, what we noticed uh, and what is a lesson that we have to learn even from the pandemic situation uh, from the last two years when the country is actually facing uh, an international crisis because it it was an international it still is an international crisis most of them uh, we follow the trend of going back to national uh, so now we really have to go back to multinational and we have to go back to uh, to cooperating together because only together we can find solution and only in dialogue we can find uh, find solution by respecting uh, each other and it doesn't matter if um, uh, it is a, a small country or it is a big country uh, if it is um, a multilateral um, cooperation or a bilateral one uh, the respect and also the international law is something that we have to to follow in order to be successful so i think i will uh, stop here but i will just have a small reply to what mr Drenin has mentioned about uh, you know building nations of the uh, new newly independent uh, states uh, as a follow up of the collapse of the soviet union in case of moldova i think that uh, this is, uh, and of course, my colleagues uh, will also uh, already refer to that. Uh, it's it's not about building nation uh, because uh, we do have a nation. It's uh, about institutions. It's about building democracy. It's about building statehood, uh, a statehood uh, which uh, is uh, uh, capable to ensure welfare to their citizens. And this can be done only through rule of law, uh, only for uh, uh, only by respecting. Uh, the human rights and human liberties and this all means democracy and um, this is why I think that uh, it's important uh, for us to continue uh, our uh, cooperation but also our uh, European aspirations uh, because this means welfare to, to our citizens and everything that does contribute to the welfare of uh, of our citizens to modernization and to uh, transformation is something uh, that uh, all the rulers will want for for their people so i think i will stop here and if there are going to be uh, questions i will be very happy to answer thank you very much Rosa. now um for giving the, the word, of course, to, to Dimitri, he can answer whatever he wants and deal with the issues he wants. 
Uh, I think personally that uh, Victoria built some bridges, perhaps. Uh, I fully understand what Eka and Hannah said and I share most of the arguments. But I think uh, when we discuss here, we should think also about possibilities to come forward, uh, not the big solution, because uh, the, the gaps or the, 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 uh, are too big and to, the difference is too big. But um, so we should a bit discuss what kind of uh, solutions are there. We also mentioned the uh, sovereign choice and possibility to do that, of course. This was also, and I'm coming from Austria, so I have not my background. Of course, it was also a free choice of Austria, deliberately done after all the troops left the country after the Second World War occupation. But then Austria joined, uh, decided on neutrality. Um, is it, a, is it a possibility or what kind of dialogue is possible in the near future? Uh, starting uh, to have some sort of understanding of other positions. Uh, is it possible or is Russia just uh, saying, why should we have a dialogue? We have our interests, we have our military. So let's, with all the respect, what has been an argument, and I don't doubt that there were wrong arguments, think about, because also to the younger people and to the victims and the families of the victims, we should sometimes give an answer which are leading forward to a more peaceful situation, even if it's not too peaceful now. Dimitri, please. You have to unmute yourself, I think. Yeah, thank you, Hannes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I actually felt uh, a lot of hot air uh, coming to me from uh, from the south, particularly from Kiev and uh, from Tbilisi. Uh, a lot of rhetoric, uh, very familiar. I will not respond to rhetoric with, uh, with to that rhetoric with rhetoric of my own. You, for that, you will need somebody else uh, to match the August company. I will say that I uh, sympathize, and this is this is sincere. I sympathize with the people who have to live in uh, self-perpetuating victimhood. I honestly do, and I see this uh, victimhood as being fundamental to nation building. It's bad news for Russia, uh, but that's uh, that's the reality. Um, a few. A few issues um, that I would want to highlight. For me, um, what happened uh, in Ukraine and between Russia and Ukraine is uh, by no means tragedy. And I, I mourn the death of all people who actually, most of them who, are, who were above 30 were my compatriots. I see the war when where both sides speak Russian and look the same and swear in the same fashion as uh, something very, very close. Something that uh, takes me back to the, to the final years of the Soviet Union and um, ask again the question, what could, uh, what should have been done differently so that the people who died, who, who had to die in, the, in those post-Soviet wars, whether in Donbass or in, uh, uh, in uh, Abkhazia or in Chechnya or elsewhere, so that these, these people would, uh, would live today. And this is, this is a question that doesn't have, uh, doesn't have a clear answer. And this is the question that I was asking as the world was celebrating just a few days ago, the 90th birthday of Mikhail Gorbachev. This is something to be, to be remembered. With regard to Ukraine, I would say uh, one good thing from, from what happened between Ukraine and Russia is that Ukraine is no longer Russia's problem. And uh, the separation from Ukraine was... Uh, um, well, it led to Ukraine's independent, independence from Russia, but it also led to Russia um, leaving Ukraine behind and in some ways being 
so much better for it. On Crimea, I would say my basic attitude to these things is uh, go with the people. And you can talk about, anyone can talk about annexation and land grab and what have you. Uh, but to me, the critical issue is the attitude of the people, the 2 million people who live in Crimea. And talking about them as having to live under occupation is um, making a travesty of the reality. The reality is different. Now, Donbass is different from, from Crimea. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can talk about that. But um, I, would, I would take issue with uh, the notion of Russia being imperial again. Russia has, um, again, embraced the notion and the position of a great power. Not a superpower, but a great power. There's a very important difference between being a great power and being an empire. An empire is often a, an act of self-sacrifice. You have to help your provinces, your uh, imperial lands, to catch up with the, um, with the central part of the empire. You invest a lot in those provinces. You care about them. Of course, you discipline them. Of course, you, we all know that from the histories of the Russian Empire, British Empire, was to Hungarian Empire. Uh, it's, it's more or less the same all over. Now, a great power doesn't care, no longer cares about the provinces. It cares about its interests. The provinces are on their own. They're all sovereign. But I would say that sovereignty in name is different from sovereignty in reality. You really become sovereign when you can, when you no longer depend on others, when, when you can pay your own way. It's just uh, like one's children becoming adult, when they can earn their way, when they're no longer, when they're no longer dependent on, uh, on daddy's handouts. And I think we have, we've reached that condition with Ukraine, we've reached that condition with Georgia, we've reached that condition with many other countries. I would say most, if not, not, not exactly all, but most of the countries. I think Russia has, um, has uh, rethought its policies toward the former Soviet countries. It no longer sees them as former and future parts of itself. It sees them as um, foreign countries, not many of them not particularly strong, not particularly well organized. Some of them, many of them, in fact, leaning to Russia's adversaries and offering their territory to those adversaries in order to get outside support uh, for their being independent from Russia. And that's, uh, that's the reality that Russia, Russia faces. In terms of... Um, of talking to and, and, and reaching some, um, some uh, understandings uh, with, uh, with the countries concerned. I think that Moldova uh, stands out. I think dialogue is still possible with Moldova. Uh, I don't know how long, it, how, uh, how long it lasts, this window of opportunity. But it's still there. With regard to Moldovan nationhood, well, it's, it's an interesting question. Is Moldova, is Moldova nation a nation in itself or is it part of the Romanian nation? I, I'm not trying to be flippant, but uh, that, that's, that's an honest question. And it has geopo a geopolitical, uh, geopolitical connotations. I think the Russians uh, learned the hard way. They shouldn't, have, they shouldn't have gone through the humiliating procedure, but when a Russian uh, a member of parliament was uh, chased out of Tbilisi for having accepted the host's invitation to sit in some chair where no Russian uh, should ever come close to. Uh, that, I think, was a very uh, clear signal to Moscow, if Moscow needed one, that uh, no dialogue with uh, Georgia is possible in the foreseeable future. That's all. And uh, there's no diplomatic relationship at this point. 
And I think that we, uh, we are stuck, which is not the worst situation because uh, the front lines have been largely quiet in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. With regard to Ukraine, unfortunately, um, the uh, front line in uh, Donbass uh, is, uh, uh, is not quiet. And uh, I must say that many of the people da who died in the war, actually the people who died in that war in Donbass, uh, the vast majority of them were Ukrainians on, on different sides. Some pro-Russian Ukrainians, if you like, other Ukrainians pro-Kiev or pro-Western um, pro Ukrainian, whatever you want to call that. But uh, they were all, it's not that everyone was killed by the bad Russians on the Ukrainian side. There were people who died on the other side of the <coughs> front line. Um, I think that the Russians invested, maybe foolishly, in uh, Vladimir or Volodymyr Zelensky recently, and even made some uh, costly concessions to Ukraine worth a few billion dollars. Uh, agreeing to uh, a court ruling, agreeing to uh, a, a contract that was not uh, very much in Russia's interest, hoping that this would lead the, the way to some sort of an understanding with Zelensky. Uh, unfortunately, uh, any illusions or hopes with regard to Zelensky turned out to be illusions. From the Kremlin standpoint, um, there's no partner in Kiev, which is very bad. Very bad. And it doesn't look like uh, there's going to be a partner in, in, in Kiev. So the, 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 uh, the best thing I, I can think of is making sure that uh, uh, the front line in Donbass does not explode, that we don't have uh, a major conflict in our hands that could sunk in Russia at some point if the existence of the so-called uh, People's Republics or self-proclaimed People's Republics, however you want to call separate republics, uh, however you want to call them, uh, if they are uh, in danger, I think that, uh, uh, th th that Russia will step in, uh, which might uh, lead to a conflict much bigger than uh, Donbass and maybe much bigger than Ukraine. And I'm very worried about that. I'm also worried about the um, theoretical uh, possibility of a blockade of the small Russian military contingent in Transnistria. Should Moldova and Ukraine decide with the blessing from elsewhere to, um, uh, to pin those Russians in, um, in, in that region, then I think we might see some, uh, some bad things happening. So I hope it doesn't happen. Uh, I hope that uh, we will not lose more people, uh, but uh, I, beyond that, I'm rather pessimistic about chances of conflict resolution. So managing conflict, yes, conflicts, uh, because there are many. Yes, I think we can, we can do that. I think we should do that. And I think that's in the interest of uh, Russia, Europe, and the United States, as well as, uh, as well as in the interests of the country is concerned. Um, beyond that, it will be difficult. But uh, let me also tell my uh, co-panelists that Russia owes nothing to anyone anymore since the end of the former Soviet Union. Uh, you're on your own. You have your own sponsors, friends, donors, allies. Uh, but Russia is... Um, is out of this equation. Let me stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now let's have a, a second uh, brief round because we are already late. Uh, so please, uh, Hannah. Thank you, Hannes. Uh, it was such a perfect example of Russian uh, um, manipulation and propaganda within the last 10 minutes. So I would really try to be brief considering the time, uh, but uh, with a few statements. You know, I really enjoyed the last phrase of Dmitry that now you three countries should be on your own. Oh my God, we wish to be on our own without Russia. That is the problem. 
And here I'm really emotional about this because that is seems what three nations are shouting for 30 years, leave us alone. And that is really a situation. The problem is that if Russia would allow three countries to be on our own, to choose our own foreign policy way, our own politicians in side of our countries, we will be just happy. And it would be our problems whom we are choosing, who are our presidents, who are our leaders, who are our partners. Uh, so the basics of this conflict is definitely coming. Uh, uh, when I said this conflict is not Russian-Ukrainian, but in general of Russia with the uh, other uh, countries, that Russia doesn't want to leave us alone. Uh, also with these, because you've been like perfectly uh, saying about uh, Donbass, for example, sorry, but those people who started the conflict, all of them were Russian citizens, not with a double citizenship. Mr. Girkin is a Russian citizen. All the leadership till 2018, both in Donetsk and Lugansk, were Russian citizens. And you would like to say that Russia doesn't care about Ukraine or its Ukrainian problem. Uh, honestly, it's, it's really just frustrating because it's not about facts. Crimea, you said go with people. Perfectly. I'm going with people. With 15% of Crimean Tatars uh, who are now under the smash of Russian uh, um, machine, uh, whose uh, um, mosque are destroyed and their religious buildings are under the uh, uh, real danger. All my Crimean Tatars and Ukrainian friends, all human rights defenders who were running Crimea because they've been arrested there or they couldn't live there. 100 Ukrainian political prisoners from Crimea only who are now in the prisons. Uh, the guy who three days ago put the flowers to one of the Ukrainian monuments in Crimea and been arrested. Three of my Crimean uh, friends from the uh, Nomos think tank who are already a few years in the prison just for the fact of being uh, um, uh, pro-Ukrainian. Uh, my Navy guys with whom I spent a lot of time drafting the Navy strategy and their stories, how they've been kidnapped in uh, March 2014, how their families been threatened to run the uh, um, uh, Venezuela. Not speaking about the United Nations General Assembly resolution in December. If you read it attentively, uh, it is wonderfully saying for what is Russia guilty, for changing demography in Crimea. You said what two million people are sinking. From them, one million people were added after 2014. So Russia already have United Nations resolution condemning change of the demography in Crimea. Or, for example, um, the uh, preliminary decision of International Court of Justice that said uh, how uh, Russian Federation are violating rights uh, according to the Convention on Discrimination, uh, where already you need to restore, for example, Medjlis. So with what people I should go in Crimea? Uh, I'm always making an example of Scotland. They were very stupid to have the campaign for independence for two years and having proper referendum. Russia had two weeks of... Uh, campaigning with weapons and blocking of the Peninsula, shutting down Ukrainian TV and then making referendum. Surely that is going with the people. You know, it seems to me, and it will be my conclusion, from all I heard from your side now and from what my colleagues were seeing, you know, the basic problem if to go like what to do, to do is to change the mindset a little bit. We've been speaking about respect to the international law. We've been speaking about respect to sovereignty. We've been speaking about values. You've been saying that Russia should not uh, agree with the international court in Stockholm, uh, that Russia don't care about something. So, you know, we are speaking about two different words, where, worlds when we are, would like to respect our rights, our choices, our values, international order and international uh, law. And you're speaking that all of these are nonsense and you're not caring about us but 30,000 of your soldiers are at our territory, yet 2,000 at Moldova territory, and yet uh, quite a number of thousand in Georgian territories. Uh, it's interesting of not caring. It's like, we don't care about you, that's why we will take you and destroy you. Uh, it's a little bit not honest, and it seems to me that while we are speaking in terms of these issues, and we are trying to manipulate with the uh, basics, 
and just to make others to believe that we are um, clean uh, while being completely dirty uh, in, uh, in terms of international uh, principles and values, uh, it would be quite a difficult dialogue. It's not that we don't want to speak with you. We are ready for this. We are doing this all the time. We really want peace at our territories. But at the same time, uh, uh, it should be from two sides. Uh, and we need to speak with the same language. Doesn't matter Russian or Ukrainian, but it should be the same language of international uh, law, values, and principles, uh, first of all. And then, you know, more and more, when you ask Ukrainians what you think about Russians, they say, we, we don't want to think about them. We don't care about them. We want to think about Ukraine. And, uh, but uh, uh, we can't do it because we still have 5% of our territory under the fire and another 7% um, being occupied. So uh, definitely, you would like to have somebody to speak in Kyiv. You have Mr. Medvedchuk being the personal friend of Mr. Putin, uh, luckily for the last few weeks under the sanctions. So the question is, do you need to have your... No, I don't understand. Yeah. Would you like to have a partner country? So that is a question. You need traitors, but pro-Russian, or you need partners? Uh, Hannah, Hannah, sorry, but... If you if you always have the same opinion, the same respect for international law, you don't need a dialogue. So I mean, what you say is, uh, I'm sorry to intervene, is there is no dialogue possible. So what what is the the rest? War? Is it fighting? Maybe Eka can uh, answer that because she spoke about the militarization. So should we go into a war? Uh, it's a bit sorry to that I'm emotional now. It's a bit too easy just to. Mm complain, to complain, to complain how bad it is. Yes, it is bad. And I agree with many arguments, but just don't say there is no way out. We just live with it as it is, or we go into a war. What should we do? This is a bit, uh, I think it's too easy just to, to repeat all these, these complaints and to have a, sorry to say, a very um, negative on the attitudes. I will make one small example and then allow Eka to continue much better with the military part. In December 2019 in Paris, leaders of Normandy 4 agreed uh, on first steps, one of which were three pieces of territories like the checkpoint where we, uh, uh, let's say, demilitarize and withdraw the uh, forces. Ukraine did it from our side. Uh, and uh, these checkpoints work de facto probably for two or three weeks only, normally. Then the shooting uh, started from another side with uh, uh, quite a heavy shelling, um, at least in Lugansk region. So that is the question. We are ready for the dialogue. We are discussing these small steps. The question is that both sides need to respect those agreements that are reached. And unfortunately, that's what we are not witnessing. Words is good, but actions are much better. Okay, thank you. Eka, please. Okay, um, uh, just a very small detour, perhaps, for the audience as well to understand, perhaps, where we come from. And actually, it was quite uh, painful, in a way, to hear out Dmitry as well, because it was so cynical and dismissive, in a way, of anything that goes in the region. But leaving that aside, I myself, uh, I'm from Abkhazian region myself. For almost two decades now, I'm not able to go to my home. So when we speak about actual realities on the ground, what it means, and ethnical cleansing that has happened in those territories, these are real. These are not geopolitical concepts. These are the real people and generations already that are experiencing that trauma. But then leaving that aside, dialogue and then pragmatism, perhaps, that we need to have as a sober eye to what is happening, right? When it comes to the conflict management situations, Dialogue is already happening, not only in the Minsk uh, negotiating platforms uh, vis-a-vis Ukraine. We have Geneva talks uh, going endlessly from 2008. 
But as a parallel process, what we have to Geneva talks is continuous expansion of the territory under the barbed wires in the South Ossetian region, for example. It's, 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 it's the factual terms. I mean, nothing imaginary. Every other time we have expansion of the territory upon which the barbed wires are placed. So people living on that ground, you literally can wake up one day and then part of your backyard of your house will be uh, already marked as a fu a future territory to be under the expanded barbed wire uh, done conducted by the Russian military. So what we can do in this situation, right? One is to have good intentions and then just to see how one can transcend an actual reality in the way to create a, a, a prosperous, peaceful environment or to have an understanding that, unfortunately, it's not a short-lived problem in which we are. So how we can reach that momentum of somewhat equal negotiating context that could be created so that it could be constructive rather than uh, dismissive in this case, right? In terms of different parties to negotiations having a bona fide approach to it, right? Uh, for the end game of negotiations. And in that case, when we are in the situation of that asymmetry, asymmetry in two ways. In strategic vision, we have yet the situation of Russia having clear strategy vis-a-vis -vis the region, but region, the rest of the region doesn't have yet that much convergence of the vision when it comes to the different literal states. And then when it comes to NATO and EU as well, uh, Black Sea is part of the, the geography as well, that there is no clear vision as a strategy without the region. So now we have that asymmetry at the strategic level. And then second is asymmetry in, in, in the presence, as I've mentioned already. So we have one country that has clarity of its vision for which the Black Sea and dominance in the region is essential for it to prove itself as a resurgent great power. And then in that sense, to project power beyond the Black Sea. And then countries that are struck in the middle of it because their sovereignty, their strength, independent choices are seen to be against that strategic vision. How one can survive as an independent nation in this case, survive for the moment when some real talks could take place, even vis-a-vis -vis Russia. You need to become stronger. And then in that sense, some re-establishment of more tolerable equilibrium in the region needs to be established. And if we are honest and pragmatic about it, there is no other way for that to happen so that Russia ceases to be dismissive to the rest of the Black Sea region countries, but takes them as somewhat <laughs> meaningful sovereign countries to talk to even, region needs to change its dynamics. And then for that, NATO presence in the region needs to be increased. Economic presence and investment in the region needs to increase from the EU as well. And for that, capacities and capabilities needs to be stronger so that we start with the first step, which is deterrence. Because so far, what we experience is an expansion, continuous expansion from Russia. It needs to stop at some point. Status quo is only within the interests of Russia because status quo is already a, 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 um, a situation in which Russia is almost uh, there with the established dominance in the region. It's, it's not fully perhaps uh, ironclad, but it's very close to that, which means that there needs to be increased mobility of the forces in the region, stronger land and aerial presence of offensive and defenses cap defense capabilities, coastal and maritime presence on the ground. And with that deterrence power of the kind that could offset that posture, an aggressive posture that we already see as a disruptive posture for even commercial maritime connectivity within the region. In that sense, as much as investment in the region could grow so that we see that all the projects related to the gas and oil pipelines that are still ongoing in terms of expansion uh, in parallel to Russia's expanding uh, plans in the region in that level as well are taking place, that maritime freedom is not disrupted, and even actions that are below Article 5 threshold are taken uh, seriously so that this aggressive posture is actually offset by the deterrence that could emerge in the region, I would believe that at least we are better off in terms of having chances that some meaningful dialogue in the future that could lead 
to the end game of re-establishment of the respect to the international law and respect to sovereignty of all countries within the region could emerge. Now for us to have a belief that dialogue in itself could lead to something without having a determination or definition of what that something is, per se, is a bit of a nonsense. Because what we experience as of now is a situation, as I've already mentioned, of uh, violated territorial integrity, interference into the domestic politics, and then open military aggressive posture uh, in the region. And if that is not balanced out, and then for that, uh, it's, it's NATO's presence and EU's presence that needs to increase, that increases the chances for the peace rather than retreat from the region. Because if the retreat from the region of NATO and EU will take place, that what actually will be the best provocation of fill the vacuum, even more expansion uh, in the region. And here I would say that either even members of NATO like Romania and Bulgaria are not from, free from any challenge. So to conclude with that, the strategies that NATO had to the uh, northeast uh, with the Baltic Sea, um, uh, presence on the ground and then strengthening of its uh, presence. Uh, there needs to be more symmetry with the southeast to the flank of NATO and then greater economic presence and investment of the EU in the region as well. And that would open up the door for meaningful conversations because if that is not happening, we see what, we, what we've heard today as well. It's just, uh, I came to your residential building, kicked you out from some apartments, and then said that I don't owe you anything, you know, go figure how you live, but you're not able to go back to your own apartment. Good luck with that. Yeah, Bye. I can understand, can understand that. You think that Turkey will be part of that, uh, strengthening uh, the military capacity in the in the region? Uh, for that, there are different variables that needs to be observed. Uh, we are all looking uh, with attention, I would say, everybody now, how the new administration of the U.S. will start to posture itself, including vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. We all understand that the relationships have been strained, uh, uh, strained uh, very significantly recently. But then the dialogue and strategy vis-a-vis -vis Turkey would be essential from the side of the U.S. as well. Uh, and with that, I would say, uh, stimulating uh, rethinking of the policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis Turkey and mediating the conflict in Eastern Mediterranean with Greece as well, to the degree that we could see coherent strategic policy of NATO in the Black Sea with Turkey being an anchor uh, in, as, as a center of gravity, so to say, without, without Turkey, there could be no balance in the Black Sea region vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Okay, thank you. Victoria? Yes, thank you. If you will allow me, and I hope I understood uh, correctly Mr. Tenin when he was talking about uh, uh, about Moldova and uh, he was not uh, referring to the escalation that could uh, lead to possible uh, violation in the region, but actually I hope that he was talking about a constructive dialogue on how to uh, withdraw the munition from uh, from the Republic of Moldova, but also the, the Russian troops that are there, and I'm not talking now about the peacekeeping mission but I'm talking about the uh, the gutter uh, that we have uh, there so definitely I think that you know in the case of Moldova when I was speaking about our frozen conflict for uh, uh, about 30 years already uh, it is a status quo that we are facing now and it is not necessarily good or bad the good thing is that uh, we don't have human losses but the bad thing is that we didn't reach an agreement uh, and a resolution um, until now and this does have an impact on the development of the Republic of Moldova and I think that also uh, an, uh, an impact on how the situation evolved in Moldova has the fact that we don't have a direct uh, border with Russia compared to Ukraine and, uh, and with Georgia so um, this is why I think that uh, indeed uh, when it comes to, to the conflict resolution what it is important is to have a very frank dialogue is to have a very frank dialogue also about the history, but also about the perspective of the country and how do they see uh, their further development in the future. And also to come to an agreement how we can move forward by uh, having uh, good partnerships uh, both with the East and with the West, if it is, uh, if it is possible. And I think that uh, if we will... Um, 
be part, uh, uh, if we will try to be partners and to be on the same page, then definitely this can be uh, this can be constructive. And I think that in this case, Russia uh, taking into account the situation in Moldova can show power. Uh, and uh, when I'm talking about power, I'm not talking about military uh, power, but they can be constructive uh, in uh, positioning themselves in a way that solutions can be found to uh, difficult situations. And here I'm uh, also thinking about the ammunitions that we have in, uh, in the Transnistrian region, the Russian ammunitions there, and how they can be destroyed and withdrawn uh, under the international mandate. And I think that this is very important and this can be a step forward. Uh, and uh, this is how Russia can also show their willingness to participate in uh, uh, in conflict resolution, but also show that they are willing to, to, uh, to start a dialogue. But this has to be a very frank dialogue. And also the withdrawal of the, of the military uh, in the Transnistrian region. I think that this is also uh, could uh, serve as a, a good example of um, uh, of, a, of a step uh, forward. When it comes to the fact that uh, does Russia owe or doesn't owe anything to to the countries, I think that um, this is a very interesting um, uh, very interesting thing to say because uh, actually I don't think that. Uh, we as countries are expecting what are we expecting is to have a frank um, and um, a very reasonable cooperation with the kind with with Russia but also with uh, with other partners because indeed we do understand that the the biggest part of the transformation the institutional transformation uh, the development relies on domestic affairs relies on domestic uh, actors and this is why uh, it is important to uh, to have the ownership uh, of uh, of your own country and of your own initiatives. And here comes also uh, the idea of choosing which development model the countries want to want to to have or to go. And this is why, as I mentioned in my previous uh, uh, in my previous intervention, both uh, or all the three countries have chosen EU because for them uh, this is a, a transformative model that uh, does lead to more democracy, to more rule of law and respect for, for human rights. And I think that here um, uh, we have to, maybe Russia again has to, to rethink its uh, strategy, its policy towards this country and to uh, show respect to, to them. And in this case, I think that uh, indeed uh, this is going to put Russia in a more powerful position than it is uh, than it is at the moment as it is seen uh, because power does not mean military power only uh, power does mean the possibility to uh, to act uh, as partners the possibility to act from uh, from the same uh, from the same position and to uh, to trust in each other and to give your partner the possibility to develop on uh, on its own and uh, again of course course, from this position, uh, I think that Moldova, as well as all the uh, all the three countries uh, uh, and my colleagues that are here will confirm this, we will all the time respect each other's territorial integrity, sovereignty and independence uh, because we do share um, the same uh, the same problems and uh, we do understand that the way that the conflicts will be resoluted in our countries will represent a model uh, for uh, for each other as well as well as the um, uh, you know the challenges the provocations but also uh, you know um, uh, the precedents uh, that we have, and we must uh, learn from each other's mistakes, but also from each other's successes. So uh, I think I will stop here, and I really do hope that in the future we will try to find models that will uh, bring us to a constructive discussion, and we will have partners with whom to have these constructive discussions. Okay, thank you very much. Now we, I think, should uh, slowly come to, to an end. Uh, I would um, take up, try to take up, uh, let's say, an objective or neutral subject, 
uh, I asked already Eka on, on Turkey, and Dimitri at the start uh, mentioned Turkey. Maybe, Dimitri, I would like to ask you, how do you see Turkey? Is Turkey gaining an influence? Is Turkey, uh, let's say, on the side of Russia, can be there an agreement? And maybe uh, ask Hannah, uh, are you disappointed that Turkey is not supporting strong, more strongly uh, Ukraine? Or do you see some, some, some sort of a partnership with the NATO country Turkey? Maybe Dimitri, please. But if you have the other remarks, of course, you are open, but we just slowly come to an end of the discussion. No, there's not much time for uh, for an expanded discussion. So, Dennis, I will I will be disciplined and I will talk uh, about the uh, the issue that you uh, gave me uh, to comment on. Um, Turkey is is part of the region. It's a major part of the region. Uh, so, uh, uh, Turkey will do what uh, Turkey can, uh, what Turkey wants, uh, what Turkey is able to do in that region. Uh, right now, I think Turkey is uh, uh, more focused on uh, on its southern and its uh, southeastern border, on on the maritime uh, border uh, and uh, farther afield. Um, if Turkey's uh, position changes, we will we will register that and see what uh, what challenges uh, arise out of that. But as I said, it's it's a it's it's a difficult relationship, as uh, as you would imagine, any relationship between two uh, major powers would be. Uh, as I said, there's a degree of cooperation, there's a degree of competition. What's interesting about uh, the relationship is that Turkey and Russia so far have managed to go through a series of crises. A real crisis with the downing of the Russian plane by the Turks, with the assassination of the Russian ambassador in Ankara, with um, uh, bloody incidents in uh, the Idlib area. But uh, so far, Moscow and Ankara have been able to uh, manage those difficult differences and those uh, and and conflicts. And uh, look at look at Nagorno-Karabakh. How Russia and Turkey have managed uh, to, uh, let's say, um, uh, to sit side by side just outside Nagorno-Karabakh, and how Russia had to accept Turkey's uh, presence, including permanent presence, including permanent military presence on the ground. And how the collaboration has been uh, has been going on. A lot of that depends, as I said, on the personal relationship between Presidents Putin and Erdogan. What happens when Erdogan eventually is uh, is is not uh, in the presidential palace, or when Putin um, ceases to be uh, the president of Russia? Anyone can tell. Uh, the relationship can go in different directions. But so far, we have. Uh, and I think we are blessed with two biggest countries in the Black Sea region, Russia and Turkey, having a manageable, manageable and largely peaceful relationship, largely because there's something going on in Syria, a largely peaceful relationship between the two of them. That counts for more than just about anything else, except for the Ukrainian situation. So let me stop here. Thank you. Anna. Uh, what to say? I, I don't know why you decided that Ukraine have any difficulties with Turkey or Ukraine is dissatisfied because Ukraine and Turkey has perfect relation. We haven't had any crises uh, or for the last seven years. Even more, Turkey completely supports Ukraine in questions of Crimean uh, uh, belonging to Ukraine, uh, in questions of Black Sea uh, navigation, uh, in questions of uh, Crimean Tatars, uh, they are supporting a lot, but even more, last year the new format has been created, so-called Quadriga, 
It is the two ministers of foreign affairs plus two ministries of defense who are meeting at least annually. And uh, just yesterday, it was the meeting uh, of Quadriga at the level of advisors who are preparing the new meeting that should be just uh, uh, in a few days. And uh, uh, the last year, President Zelensky visited Turkey for four times, something like this. So we had uh, meetings like almost each month on the level of either Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Defense uh, or uh, President himself. So the level of strategic partnership now at the topest level. Ukraine definitely carefully watching the relations of Turkey with Russia. But here uh, we've been explained from the very beginning that, first of all, our relations are, are going in parallel, meaning that Turkey is not going to ally with Russia about Ukraine. They have their own business, first of all, in terms of economy, uh, then energy and definitely certain uh, issues that they need to discuss, like Syria, for example, or, or wherever else. Uh, definitely last year on the Gorne Karabakh. But at the same time, in all principal and priority issues, Turkish uh, position is completely with Ukraine. And uh, for all these years, we never had any doubts um, in, uh, in their positions. Definitely, we understand that Turkey now is more aware about Middle East rather than the Black Sea. It's been visible. But let's say that they are not uh, stopping watching on the Black Sea. They are opening now a new Navy base near Georgia. So exactly it was the reaction to the Kerch incident and the desire to have their forces in the Black Sea, not only on the Western side, but also on the Eastern. And Turkey is actively supporting Ukrainian Navy. Ukrainian uh, uh, Ministry of Interior, who are in charge of border um, maritime border uh, service, and the Ministry of Interior, so National Guard. They are training, they are supplying equipment, and don't forget about our strategic agreements and military technical sphere. We are now creating together uh, drones and uh, military cargo airplanes. So you can't say that uh, countries have bad relations when they're developing such types of weapons together and military equipment. Thank you. No, it was uh, was a question if uh, you are satisfied or not. So it seems you are very satisfied. So thank you very much. I think uh, unless Eka and Victoria want to come in, uh, Eka? Um, not not as a, a big, big comment or anything, just wanted to uh, bring this as an information perhaps to the uh, audience as well, that while discussing everything that we've discussed, we need to be mindful of the fact that life goes on in the region and we are building our institutions, we are building our states, we are building bilateral and multilateral relations when it comes to the Black Sea region, uh, I mean, with Bulgaria, Romania, with Turkey in it, Ukraine in it. So it's not that there is a stalemate of that kind. So this is actually that message that I wanted to convey that we cannot become a hostage of whatever the strategy is in the Black Sea region of Russia, but we have to become stronger, we have to become more prosperous, and then with that there will be a better chance of uh, potentially more constructive dialogue in the future to emerge than with Russia itself as well. Victoria? Yes, I would just like to thank you and to thank the panelists for addressing this issue because I think that it is very important and quite crucial right now to discuss the situation in the Black Sea region. And I think that there were a lot of points raised in our discussion with, which can be considered for a follow-up discussion and uh, definitely would be very happy to, to engage further on. Thank you. Dimitri, anything to add? Unmute. Unmute yourself, Dimitri. Yes. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, Hannes. I, I just wanted to thank you for your excellent moderation of this uh, fairly uh, heated conversation uh, on some parts. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you, all of you. Uh, I think it was uh, an interesting discussion. It was, as was mentioned, heated. It showed the reality. I think uh, anything else probably would would be, uh, let's say, covering the realities in the ground, uh, the emotions which I hear and the different perspectives. Um, well, I'm always looking for some compromise or for some solution. For the moment, it's, I think, not possible. 
But again, as I said, if you can agree on all the rules, you don't have uh, to have a dialogue. Uh, it's just because uh, there are different opinions about rules, international rules that you need in the end of the day, some dialogue, but maybe it's too early and maybe some conditions have to be met. As Eka said, maybe some more equilibrium military and economically have to be met that you can come into a serious dialogue. But uh, all I want to say is that the more presence of the military should not lead to war, but should lead to peace in the end. And that is, I think, uh, important. Thank you very much uh, again. Thank you very much to Dimitrios uh, in Istanbul for organizing and, and making it possible. And uh, let's hope to meet again in times, maybe even personally, if uh, COVID and the virus let us uh, also have some uh, dialogue uh, in person along the way soon. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. And, Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Be healthy and uh, get vaccinated as long as, as you <laughs> don't have it already, as Hannah has. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.